Great. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Great to be with all of you today, and welcome to Providence and the Warren Albert Medical School of Brown University. Thank you for being here, and it is just absolutely wonderful to see so many families gathered to participate in this really exciting and very, very special family weekend. So thanks again for being here. Those that don't know me, my name is Mukesh Jain. I started about eight months ago as the Dean of Medicine and Biological Sciences at Brown. And I am accompanied and will introduce shortly uh, four of my colleagues and leaders within uh, the school. So I mentioned this is a particularly special weekend, and that is because this family weekend for us here at the medical school is, is an amazing moment. We are celebrating 50 years of medicine at Brown, 50 years of educating the next generation, 50 years of providing excellence in healthcare, and 50 years of advancing science and innovation to advance discoveries to impact human health. This weekend is also not just about the past, but it's about the future, the next 50 years as we look towards it. And you should have great pride in knowing that your students, and I just met, I can't find them out, there's, there's first year Pliny students, there's those that are entering medical school at all different levels. You should take great pride in knowing that your students' efforts are going to help shape the next 50 years at Brown. And, uh, and their, their, their contributions will be remembered 50 years from now. Today we have, as I mentioned, a small panel of medical school and Pliny leaders. Uh, and they're going to help us um, discuss the latest updates, initiative, goals as they relate to student experience. And our conversation will focus on education, research, diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives, and current initiatives of wellness. But before we get too far into it, it's always helpful to be grounded in what the mission of any entity is, and in this case, our medical school. And I'll just read to you that the mission is to support and promote the health of individuals and communities through innovative medical education programs, research initiatives, and clinical excellence in service to society and to improve the health and wellness of all. In the mission are written our four structural guideposts, or our four pillars, if you will. And those are education, research, clinical care. Those are the typical, as we often call it, tripartite mission. But we've added a fourth community engagement. These four pillars are interdependent. No one pillar can flourish without the other. And our pillars are also built on, on, on a foundation to create a learning and training environment that fosters equity, diversity, inclusivity, wellness, and social responsibility across the entirety of the division and beyond. Our panelists today are not only leaders in each of these foundational pillars, they're also leaders in shaping PLEMI and the medical education experiences for our students. And like the pillars, they actually have to work together to make this happen. They happen to like each other, which is really, really great. And, uh, and, and they together ensure that our students are not only receiving a stellar education, but that it's distinctively brown, and that our students' well-being is a top priority. So before we get underway, I'll turn it over to each of our panelists to tell a little bit about themselves. And because she's closest to me, I'm going to start with Star Hampton. Thank you so much, Mukesh, and um, I'm thrilled to be here today. Um, I just I just finished, I think, my ninth week as Senior Associate Dean of Medical Education at the Warren Albert Medical School at Brown University, and so I'm, I'm really excited that my ninth week culminates in speaking to the parents of the students that I care very, very deeply about. Um, I uh, am new to this role, but I've actually been part of the Brown community since 2006 when I moved to Providence. Um, I, think it, I think it's important for you to know that I entered medicine in a similar pathway as Pliny, but not Pliny. Um, I actually entered medicine through a pathway called Science and Humanities. I went to Williams College and they had a partnership with Mount Sinai School of Medicine. 
that back in the day when I went to medical school, that was a kind of a new concept. Brown, of course, was at the forefront with the PLEMI program, but um, Mount Sinai and Williams had a partnership where um, I was not pre-med. I, I majored in humanities. I was actually a gender studies major and um, did a lot of economics and literature and art history. And I uh, was admitted into medical school in my sophomore year at Williams. And I wasn't really sure that I was going to attend medical school because I didn't know what it was all about. Like, maybe something like some of our Plamy students. <laughs> um, but uh, our, I, I took the time and I thought about it and I did uh, um, matriculate to Mount Sinai. And I, I specialized in OBGYN and became a pelvic surgeon. And then moved here after my three-year fellowship in pelvic surgery um, to become faculty. And soon after I became faculty here, the opportunity opened to be the leader of the third year course, the clinical course for OBGYN called the core clerkship. Um, I was a new and eager faculty member and I thought that sounded like a lot of fun and really cool and a great way to get involved in the medical school. And so I became the core clerkship director. And I really loved that. That was really the turning point in my career, even though it was like three months after I, I, um, I arrived here because it, became, it got me really involved here in medical education with the students and at the medical school. And from there, I just became more involved in what was happening here at Albert Medical School, but also very involved in OBGYN education nationally. Um, I led a group for quite some time um, for national OBGYN education at the undergraduate level. We write the medical objectives for learning nationally. Um, we write a lot of different um, guidelines for educators in OBGYN nationally. Um, so that was that was uh, such an exciting chapter of my life. And then I handed the clerkship off um, to one of my colleagues and became vice chair of education for my department and then moved into the role of interim chair of my department for uh, almost two years when um, that role was needed from me. I then led uh, was chief education officer for one of our large healthcare systems here called Care New England um, and held that role until this senior associate dean role opened at the medical school. And this was such a fantastic opportunity and a natural fit for my passions of um, really educating students, thinking about curriculum, thinking about student affairs and all of the elements that go into really forming our next generation of amazing healthcare providers and um, physicians. I'm so inspired by your uh, loved ones, your children. They are incredible, every one of them. And I really have enjoyed the past nine weeks and I'm looking forward to any of your questions. Good, ap Good afternoon. Oh, does that work? Oh, yeah. Okay. So I don't think you have to hold it though. Oh, just, just press this like There we go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm learning how to use buttons, everyone. Um, <laughs> hello, I'm Kelly Holder. I have the honor of being our inaugural chief wellness officer here at the medical school. Um, I've spent the last seven years of my career. Um, supporting medical students, graduate students, uh, residents and physicians around wellness and mental health. I'm a clinical psychologist by training. And I love, I think the thing I want you to know is that I love this work. I love it because there's something really special about aiding people in their own wellness in the work that they love to do. So helping people attach good meaning to it and then helping a system create uh, policies and procedures so that people can stay well. So while I have enjoyed my one-on-one -on -one work as a clinical psychologist, there's something really special about creating a program that aids many people in being well. And so I look forward to all the work that I will continue to do here and I'm sure you'll hear more about it. Hi, everyone. It's great to be here. I see some familiar faces. I'm Judy Jang. I'm the Interim Associate Dean at the Program in Liberal Medical Education. Um, and I am a product of this program. Um, we were just talking that we're plenty proud. We're going to make that a hashtag. Um, <laughs> but... I came um, from high school as a student who was eager to be a physician here at Brown to take advantage of the open curriculum 
Um, and I explored it. I took visual art classes, I took economics classes, I took city politics, um, and I was an economics and a biology concentrator. Um, I did med school here, and after graduating, I uh, went to Washington University in St. Louis, where I did my training in internal medicine and nephrology. And I stayed on faculty there for several years before we were so happy to move back to Providence um, and to be back at Brown again. So um, it's really my privilege to have been in this interim role since the beginning of this year. Um, and just to be with our students, um, shepherd them through the journey, and it's a long one. Um, and I also serve as a Mary B. Arnold mentor in med school, um, you know, mentoring some of the med students as well. So, um, so happy and welcome. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Pat Quadfian. My pronouns are she and her. I am the inaugural Senior Associate Dean for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion here at the medical school. Um, as Judy mentioned, I am also Cleamy Proud. I'm very proud to have graduated from this institution, um, undergrad 94 and medical school 98. Um, I think, you know, like maybe many people who are sitting in this room, um, I knew that medicine was my path very early on. And so the Cleamy program was very appealing to me. However, I did not have physicians in my family. I'm a first generation American. My parents are both Haitian immigrants, neither of whom were physicians, but they knew about my passion towards medicine and healthcare very early on. Um, when I was six years old, I explained to my mother that I wanted to spend the rest of my life taking care of children. And she told me, well, you should be a pediatrician. And I said, well, what is that? And she said, that's the doctor that you see all the time. I asked her to teach me how to pronounce pediatrician, and so whenever anyone asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up, I could say, I want to be a pediatrician. Many years later, I won't tell you how old I am, I am a pediatric hospitalist and really thrilled to be one and really um, owe the PLEMI program a debt of gratitude for helping that uh, to happen. I was born and raised in Brooklyn, New York. I actually, after attending a college and medical school here, went back to New York because as a true New Yorker, I think the world revolves around New York, um, and did my training at NYU Bellevue. Um, I worked there for many years as a pediatric hospitalist and then became involved in residency education and began leading the pediatric residency program. I did that um, actually for five years and during that time got involved at a national level with what we call graduate medical education. So all of the medical education that happens after individuals graduate from medical school and was very passionate about that and, and remained passionate about it. In 2018, um, I was offered an opportunity to come back to my second home, uh, which is Brown, uh, also as a residency program director and was very excited to take on that role here at Brown and continue to do that um, here at Brown until just six months ago. Uh, when I began my role as a Senior Associate Dean in Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Um, like Dean Hampton, medical education has really been a passion of mine, and my approach to diversity, equity, and inclusion has really been through the lens of my um, passion for medical education. As a woman of color who has gone through um, our system and our environment, I think what was always clear to me as I was traveling through the system um, was that the system was not necessarily made to help support my success as a woman of color. And I could see ways that we could fix the system so that it could be a supportive system for individuals who identify in all different types of ways. And that's really how I came um, to become passionate about DEI work. There are so many individuals who are interested in caring for other human beings who don't feel like the system is built for them to help them become successful. And I think my role in DEI is to make sure that there is a space for all individuals who are dedicated to patient care to feel supported and to thrive within our environment. So I'm very excited to speak with you all. I'm always very excited to work with your children and with the students. At the end of the day, our students are the ones who really teach us what more we need to do, how more we need to, how much more we need to move forward to create environments that are healthy and inclusive for them. And I'm so thrilled that you allow us to work with them um, for this brief period of time and help really mold them into the physicians of the future. Thanks everyone. Those were great introductory comments. And we the rest of the time is really to answer questions that might be on your mind. 
and we have uh, microphones in on both sides. So, well, I maybe um, did I see? Some? Oh, good. Yes. Um, I guess. Um, I guess for undergraduate students too, but since you work with mainly medical students, at what point <coughs> through the four years of medical education is like tends to be like the toughest like point for medical students where they need the most support? Um, you can start. I'll start. Yeah. I think that's a great question. From my perspective, we have a lot of data that shows that um, increases in burnout, depression, and anxiety go up from first year, up to second year, up to third year, and then it drops <laughs> off at fourth year, right? And that's what the data consistently shows and tells us. And some of the things that we're doing here, and we've started doing this year at um, the medical school is that we are meeting our third year medical students on clerkship every block. So I go and I meet them myself between myself and we have a dean for the healthy learning environment and we're asking them how they're doing. We're making sure um, they have a place to check in around their mental health. We're making referrals if they need to, but not only that, we're collecting information so that we can do whatever um, we can do as administrators to improve the environment as needed. So although we know it goes like that, we have some things in place to provide support and make sure our students are successful. Thanks, Kelly. Start, you want to add? To that? Yeah, I'll just add that medical school, like life, right, is filled with transition points and filled with changes when um, our students need to adapt and learn about new things and learn new environments, whether it's going from our preclinical years to our clinical environments or going to thinking about the transition into internship and their um, graduate medical education. Uh, so there's so many times uh, that, you know, students, I think, have stress points over the course of the four years. And really what I want to stress today is that they have a whole team behind them, right? It's not just the four of us and the five of us here in this room, but there's a whole team here um, at Albert Medical School that really is invested in their success and wants to support them when they need that support. And, um, you know, I think we have our doors are always open. I know I tell the students all the time, like, just come by and drop by my office. And I don't think they believe me because only four have in the past nine weeks. <laughs> but I did get four drop in unannounced, which was great. Um, but, you know, we're, we're really here um, to be a supportive network for the students and um, are constantly trying to think and want their feedback on what they need as well. Judy, Pat, you have a lot of experience uh... Judy with Plimi and Pat as a program director. Anything to add? Stress levels? When do they? When are they the highest? I think they're probably the lowest in your undergraduate years. <laughs> and I think that's a pretty healthy observation. Um, but I would say probably the transition. I mean, obviously, we're talking with our seniors now moving into first year. That's a big jump for anybody in any situation, and so. Um, you know, just like Star and Kelly said, in the undergraduate setting, we have sort of parameters in place and folks in place to meet with students to help them with this transition all the way through. Um, a few of us actually are Mary P. Arnold mentors, as I mentioned before, and it's just nice to kind of maintain that continuity. And for my students who, you know, have graduated, many kind of come back from med school, um, you know, and, and still meet with me on campus to talk about unrelated things, related things, match um, whatever really is on their mind. So um, we really are here to sort of support the students through the journey, um, but probably the transition I would say between senior year and first year is not unexpected to be, you know, a big one. And then of course, after the fourth year goes up, I'm sure if you extend that, maybe with internship year, there's a little bit of stress too with that transition as well. Uh, before attending this meeting, I actually was on the phone with um, a former chief resident um, of mine, and so she might argue that 
this is the most stressful time for her in her uh, medical career. But I think uh, more importantly, I, I think what's um, what's so wonderful about Brown is really the community of individuals that you have to support you through all of those stressful moments. And there are certainly key moments of transition that I think each student experiences where um, they are under an enormous amount of stress, but each of you are individuals with lives. And so those moments of stress may or may not map to the ones that we are used to. You might have things happening in your personal lives, in your family life. There might be things happening in society um, that begin to cause you stress at moments where you didn't really anticipate it. And I think what is special about Brown is the community of individuals that you have around you who are really prepared to support you through all of those moments. And that community continues for years and years. In fact, um, one of my good friends who is a Plimi alum with me is visiting this weekend. She was a big source of um, support for me in medical school. Uh, and she has been a part of my community um, for many, many, many years. And I think the community that you find here at Brown of faculty members, of mentors and advisors, but also of peers um, are really poised to help you through some of those more difficult moments. Um, and the last reflection I will make is Always remember that all of us have been through it too. And I think there is a great deal of comfort in that. When you're in the midst of your most stressful moment, you often feel like there's no way anyone could understand what I am going through right now. And I think what you'll learn, um, especially within the Brown community, is people will be really open and transparent with you about their own struggles so that you don't feel alone, but so also you know that there's a path forward. Um, because all of us went through it. Um, there are plenty of exams that were challenging. There were exams that I failed. There were, there were all, so many difficult points. Um, but being able to rely on individuals who can share with you their own struggles and also comfort you and provide you the support is really what was key um, in my own success. And I think it's going to be key in the success of everyone in this room. Thank you. All right. Someone transitioning from uh, fourth year undergraduate to first year of medicine, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> let's see, thank you. I was hoping to ask a little bit about what sort of structured um, mentorship programs or advising um, relationships are sort of set up for us in medical school, um, whether that's with peers or with deans or faculty. Star and Judy, thank you. So what I would say is as a plimi, um, you should utilize actually some of the Micklejohn advisors that you have and some of the students that um, are peers um, who are older than you that you may have been exposed to as an undergrad. So when we talk to many students, students who develop relationships with um, you know, as freshmen with juniors and seniors, when you're a senior, those students are typically in their third and fourth year of med schools, and they're just folks that you can really sort of maintain a longitudinal relationship with. So that's sort of an informal way um, that many of our students are finding that, you know, peer advising is in place. I know for med school, there's Al's Pals, where um, it's similar sort of to the Micklejohn program, where students are connected um, with med student peers as well. Um, there's Student Health Council, where, which is available to both PME and Alpha Medical students, where um, typically when I make referrals for PME students, I say, this is a PME student, and it would be great if you could set them up with someone who is also a PME who was in med school, so that they understand that they've been through the process. Formally, in terms of advisors, there's a Mary B. Arnold mentoring program, which is a longitudinal program similar to the PME advising program, um, where we're meeting with students um, as frequently. Definitely, you know, there's a minimum where we're kind of checking in and hounding you a little bit. Um, but certainly, we're available when you need to sort of go through when you just start through orientation week um, and then checking in on how you're doing to step advising. Um, and now for the third year is sort of going through, you know, what specialty should I decide on? I love so many. And for my fourth years, we're just entering interview season right now. So 
Um, it's really similar, I think, to the Pliny advising system. So it's a great um, program that's in place. And not only that, not only are you assigned to a mentor, but we have the whole network of mentors and other folks beyond in the Brown community that we can always dip into. So, um, and, and then just to add to that, um, Dean Jang, we also have advisors, specialty advisors. So your Mary B. Arnold mentor may not be um, in the specialty that you want to pursue as a career. So when you enter fourth year and you know what specialty you're going to be pursuing as a career, you'll be assigned a specialty advisor as well. So that that person can really guide you through navigating the process of pursuing that specialty as a career, which I think is really helpful to have your Mary B. Arnold, who's known you since first year, but then a specialty advisor who can really help navigate the nitty gritty of the specialty that you choose. And then our last structured mentoring, or maybe not our last, but the one that I can speak to um, is our MedStep program. MedStep stands for Mentoring and Educating Diverse Students and Trainees to Excel as Physicians. Um, and that is a group of uh, it's really a group that's meant to leverage what we call tiered mentorship. Um, so we ask faculty and house staff, so residents and fellows, to serve as mentors um, to our students. All the individuals who are in our group are self-identified as underrepresented in medicine. So really all different types of minoritized and marginalized identities um, come and join our group. Uh, and they receive mentorship not only from faculty members and from trainees, but they also provide peer mentorship um, for one another. So students mentor one another, residents and trainees mentor one another. And as a faculty member, I also receive and give mentorship um, to uh, our, our faculty who are involved in med step. So that's another layer and another opportunity for individuals to find community um, within Brown, but also to help to find that support that you're looking for in mentorship. Hi, um, my name is Howard. I want to ask a question about competition. I, I'm actually an attorney who went to law school, and I, I found that we were very friendly amongst our students, but when it came to exams, you know, everyone was out for the best grades, and they, were, they weren't always as helpful. We, I, I found out later, you know, we were in study groups, and some people had a separate notes that they didn't share with the other teams. And, you know, you get through it, but there was that level of competition. I'm hearing about the support, and I understand that. I'm just wondering how competitive is it for students with internships? My wife's a physician, she's a cardiologist. I know there's competition for residencies. I know people want to be AOA. You know, and just how much is that? A factor in, in medical education today? So I think if you speak with some of our students, actually when I was interviewing for this position, one of the things that really resonated with me was many of our students talked so much about the collaborative nature of this medical school and how the student body is so collaborative. And I think one of the things that really fosters that is that in the first and the second year, our classes are pass-fail. So there are not, there's no grading, you know, there's not um, numerical grades or, or, or um, alpha grades for uh, achievement in the first and second year. So it's pass fail with formative and summative feedback. So I think that that's really, really helpful to fostering that climate of collaboration. In our clinical years, we currently have an honors pass fail system. Um, with a group of students um, achieving honors in some of the clinical years. But that's something we might look at um, as we progress and, and take a look at the curriculum over time and see if that's something that we want to want to keep or if that's valuable for our students. I think overall, though, on the wards that that sense of collaboration spills over. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, when they're on their clinical wards, there's so many factors that go into their um, success as students. And part of the factor as a success as a student is your teamwork, right? That's what we really are looking for in great physicians. Being a physician is being part of a team. And so being a collaborative student is actually to your benefit on the ward. So that's really helpful. Um, and then we come into the, to the transition to residency. And as you said, that can be really com you know, competitive. We do currently have an AOA chapter here at Albert Medical School. One of the factors that we look at for AOA is academic achievement, but it's not the only factor that we look at. And in fact, for academic achievement, almost 50% of the class um, achieves that 
um, variable to be considered for AOA. So um, I will say that I think overall, as best as we can, we try and create a community of collaboration and support amongst the students and their peers. And I think we've achieved that from talking to students, but certainly want to know if we haven't and where those pain points are for our students so that we can try and reduce them. I would, um, I would really echo uh, Dean Hampton's statements about medicine being a team sport. Uh, again, coming from the other end where we are trying to recruit students into um, residency programs, the last thing that you want is a resident who doesn't know how to work within a team. As a program director, those are the residents you always get called about. Those are the residents that you hear the most complaints about. And sadly, those are the residents that make patient errors, because if you can't work within a team, you are going to harm a patient. And so that, um, that essence of teamwork, that ability to collaborate, that ability to communicate clearly is something that program directors are looking for. Uh, grades are, of course, really important, but I always tell students, I tell residents this, I can teach someone to pass a test. I might not be able to teach you how to work in a team. I need you to come with that skill set so that you can really hit the ground running when you're in the hospital system. Uh, and I think that Brown does an exceptional job of training um, students to be very sensitive to that, to really be able to work in a team, to be empathetic, to be able to communicate to families. Those are the skills that are really distinguishing um, individuals as exceptional physicians. And on a very personal note, many years ago when I attended medical school, um, there was really no sense of that competition. Um, again, I'll point out before, my friend was not here when I pointed out to her, so you guys probably thought she was imaginary. She's not. She's sitting right there. Um, <laughs> Michelle Bernoulli Wilson went to medical school with me. We were PLEME students together. We studied together in the old medical school, which basically meant we studied in a basement room <laughs> together for hours on end. There was a study group of five of us. Um, we shared all of the information, all of the content. We really did rely on one another for support um, through, our resident, or through our medical school process. We are still all very good friends. And I think that culture of collaboration and working together is something that attracted me to the medical school many, many years ago. And I think it's a part of the culture that is really has really been maintained. And it's something lovely to see as a faculty member now that our students continue to really function in that space. That helpful, Howard? Yeah. Yes. I, I think it is very much in the ethos of Brown, uh, what you've heard. I mean, even at the undergraduate level, I have friends who have children that just left New Penn and transferred to Columbia. And the level of stress and competition at a school like New Penn at the undergraduate level, my friend's son noticed an enormous difference. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, and I, do, I, I was going to add, this is very, you know, we're commenting about Brown, but everything that you heard is not necessarily extrapolatable to other institutions. But that's what I meant by it's very much in the ethos of Brown, and it goes back, um, you know, just a few years when, when Pat was training, and uh, just, 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 just like four or five years, and, uh, and, uh, and it continues today, and that's really beautiful to see, and it's a long-standing part of the, uh, the, the culture of the, the institution. Yeah, thank you. Yes, question. Dr. Holder, this uh, question is specifically for you. I am wondering what kinds of systems are in place or what you um, imagine being in place as far as mental health for our med students. Thank you. That's, that's a really great question. I love it. Um, because we are, so my history is I've been at the medical school for a year and eight months. And during my first year here, I focused primarily on students, and now I have the blessing of being able to support across the continuum. And so there's some things that we're, we've already started that we have, there's things that we're building, and then there's things that we hope to come. So I'll start with what we already have. We do have an embedded therapist within the medical school, and that's really wonderful because everyone has access to CAPS, but our embedded therapist makes their hours and everything just for the medical students. They're easy to access, it makes it easy. Another thing that we did starting this year, last year we started with wellness checks for all of our incoming students and returning students. They were opt-in, so you had to reach out and make an appointment. 
This year they were opt um, opt out. So I I had 144 students scheduled onto my calendar to check in with them about their wellness. And they get to decide whether they want to keep this appointment or not. As of today, we're at a 43% um, compliance rate. I think we're going to get above 50% by the time we get um, all the appointments will be done about the mid of November. And so this gives students an opportunity just to check in about how they're doing around academics, self-care, um, hot topics around their mental health, and then get a specialized referral, like what will work for you? We can have a discussion about it. What do you need right now? What are you experiencing? And I give students referrals right on the spot. I email and follow up with people about what they need. And I often even give people time. I'm going to check in with you two weeks from now and see what you need. And so there's, there's an extra level of care around that. The other thing that we started this year is that we have an um, optional mental health and wellness assessment that all the students receive right around just a few weeks after their transition into the next year. So um, every student uh, from our first years to our fourth years got it at a timely period right around their transition into the next year. And then um, we blocked some time. We gave them some food and said, hey, fill this out if you choose. And the assessment is long. It takes about 30 minutes to do. But what happens at the end is you get this print out with all of these measures about how you're doing around depression, anxiety, what's your mindset like? Do you feel like you belong here? Um, all sorts of things. And then they can use that information either to take to a therapist they're already seeing, a coach that they're working with, maybe they're even their Mary B. Arnold mentor and say, here, this is how I'm doing. How can I get help and support? I had several students come to my office and say, I want to show you what I got. What do you think I should do next? Right. And we also had those well checks soon after that for the first year so they could bring in that information and, and get help in that way. And so those are some things that we put in place to put protections. The other thing that I do in this group has been here for a long time is Student Health Council. I can't talk enough about how wonderful it is that we have a peer um, support group on our campus. Um, I support that group. We also have support from the Physicians Health Program here at Rhode Island. A local psychiatrist comes in and supports that group. So they can um, talk with us about the cases that they have. They um, know who to make referrals to if it's beyond what a student can talk to another student about. And they also do programming around mental health. Um, one of the best programs they do is uh, uh, vulnerability as strength. If you haven't attended one of those, it's just wonderful because they allow um, physicians to come in and just talk about what it's like to be a real person and experience the stressors and the challenges around living a real life, which could include mental health challenges. Because one of the things we really wanna do is take the stigma away and say, you are a human being and you get to ask for help. And we get to help you do that because that's gonna allow you to um, live out the profession that you've chosen in the best of ways and help people in the best of ways. So that's some of the stuff we're doing. You also get a sense that Kelly is three people rolled into one. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions? All right. This could be a tough one. I'm just warning the panelists, I have a feeling. Hi, I'm Tas. I'm a first year plebe here at the college. And I was just wondering for for undergrads, we have a ton of plebe events and whatnot that have helped us kind of become really close and form really strong friendships. What sort of activities and events at the med school do you have for community building? Um, I know someone mentioned intramural sports. Do you have other sorts of things like that? Thank you. So we have, it's, uh, I think we exploded this year with student interest groups. I just met with a leader of our student senate and he was saying that there's so many student interest groups that he can't you know, keep track of all of them and all their requests. Um, there, there's a huge community of, um, as we said, support among students and community building. And so 
First thing that I would say is that there's lots of interest groups to become involved with um, here at the medical school for certain things that you may be already excited about or things that you know nothing about and you want to learn about and just go to um, and see what community of students are sort of interested in that as well and learn from them too. So I think one of the one area um, that lends a lot of support to our students here um, to kind of find, find pockets of community are our student interest groups and um, affinity groups. We have several affinity groups as well um, uh, that you know, are um, centered more around identity versus interest. Um, so that can be really helpful for support um, and finding community while you're here on campus. Um, there's always, I, you know, there's always something happening at night here at the medical school uh, where students are gathering and learning or sharing or doing. Um, so it's, it's a really vibrant community and it's a really um, exciting place to be. Um, every time I walk down the stairs and think about going home, I'm always sidetracked by something that's happening. And I have to just remember that I that I can't go to everything. Um, I don't know if other people have thing more specifics. That's that's what I can tell you. Now. Oh, Kaylee's has something. No. Oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> she was just giving me a sign. Uh, Mukesh. Oh, it's meant for me. But good, keep going. Yeah. <laughs> Let's get the other inputs. That, that. That's what I know from my nine weeks of being here. So I will say um, what Dean Hampton had mentioned in terms of the preclinical electives as plebeis, um, many of those preclinical electives are open to you. So like I'm sending out tons of emails. Um, and if you see that some of them aren't, um, you can always ask the student leaders. And some of them have reconsidered or said, you know, if we have space availability, we're happy to welcome plebeis too. So um, there really is a continuum, I think. And so you know, for instance, if you're interested in oncology, you can try to join, you know, preclinical elective if that's available and things like that at the med school. So take advantage of that as an undergraduate student, too. And I would say if you have ideas that you, you, you know, maybe you haven't heard or you have an idea that you want to share, um, we're all very accessible by email, so you might consider uh, doing that. All right. And... We will, yep, we have time for one question. Perfect, the best for last. Uh, one question. Um, how many Brown students do you accept beyond the uh, the 60 that are in the Plumy program? Is that your allotment of undergraduate of Brown students? So the, the Plumy program usually matriculates about 60 students per year, and we matriculate 144 students into the medical student class. In total, not total. Just from Brown. Uh, so 144 students total, of that 144, approximately 60 per year are PLEMI students, but that number is quite variable because 60, about 60 are um, admitted into the under, you know, as a freshman in college at Brown, and when they matriculate into the medical school class, some students take some time off, some students don't, right. so it may not be an exact 60 every year. Right, but what I'm asking, what I'm asking is there are 144 students in total in each class? Correct. Or from Brown, there are 144 students. 144 students in total. 60 of those are PLEMI students. Okay, so. Approximately. So, and then so we may I, take Brown students that weren't PLEMI. Yeah, that's what I'm asking. Yeah. yeah the 80, the yep. 80 other is non from all over the country. Right. right. And of course, there are many talented students who are not PLEMI, so we certainly yeah. consider them as well. All right, I think we are at time. I hope you found this helpful. I want to thank our panelists. Uh, a, a round of applause for our panelists for all their. Interviews.